how do you talk about the greatest city in the world? Is it its art and architecture, its economy, its military, its politics? Is it the people or the rulers? Is it the environment? It's just too much. This is the furthest reaches of Greater India. This is where Hinduism became Buddhism, where French colonials surveyed the jungles. There are still bullet holes from the Khmer Rouge in the walls of these temples. There's carvings from tourists. It's truly Cambodia. Every story you tell from Cambodia is rooted here in Angkor. But it's just too much. So I'm going to focus on golden ages, specifically how they end. Because North America is in a golden age right now, at least the tail end of one. And I think that there are patterns around the world that we can look at to sort of help stave off our own decline. So let's look at the story of Angkor. In the early 800s, a rebel by the name of Jayavarman II declared independence from the Champa Kingdom and began conquering his way north. Once he got to the Tonle Sap Lake, he decided to set up his capital, actually not far from where we're standing now, and begin the Khmer Empire. You kind of have to trust the architecture just as much as you do the text to find out the real story here. But Jayavarman wasn't exactly a builder, and neither was his son. It was only in the time of his grandson, Indravarman, where a vision was seen. He needed people to believe that his ancestors were gods, and therefore he himself would be a god. It wasn't that big of a stretch, honestly, because his ancestors had claimed they were gods, and the people had believed them. But the problem was they'd been buried so plainly. You can't put dirt on top of a god. They need a temple all their own. So he constructed temples for his ancestors and started a pattern that would continue throughout the empire. But future kings weren't going to rely on their successors to show their glory. They built the most impressive temples for themselves. But you know how it is with building. You start and it can be hard to stop. You know, you build a temple here, a tomb there, and all of a sudden you've got yourself a city. And then you have to feed those people. Indra Varman ordered his subjects to dig a reservoir. At that time, the largest reservoir in human history. Controlling such an unprecedented amount of water would have allowed him thousands more farms. And rice meant security, prosperity, and power. The era of builders is generally what's considered the golden age of the Khmer period. Angkor means city, and accurately so. Their cities were beyond impressive, far more populated, grand than anything that existed on Earth at that time. In the Angkor system, each king built the temple in which they would be buried. As you can see with Angkor Wat here, they all had to kind of be better than the last one. You had to one-up the previous king, of course. So they cleared out a big section of the jungle, they expanded a big mega structure right in the middle, they started pushing out reservoirs and irrigation to build the farms that surround it, they took a symbol of the king's virility, plugged it right in the center of the temple, and that was now the new spiritual capital of the empire. And over the next few hundred years, this one upmanship would fill this region with some of the most impressive megastructures ever produced. And they are impressive. But they must have been so costly. It would have taken thousands of stonemasons, artists, laborers, craftsmen just to build one of these. And on top of that, it would take thousands more to upkeep the temples that already existed. And somebody had to feed them. So the farming community got new reservoirs, new irrigation, and they began pushing further and further back into the jungle. And there's no denying that the Angkor Golden Age was magnificent. It was incredible what they did here. Recent archaeology suggests that there were a million people living here at a time when London had 30,000. It was the biggest city on earth. It would be industrialization and hundreds of years before any other civilization got close to this level of city building. The architecture here is stunning. It can be even hard to fathom. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of temples dotting this landscape, each of which would be a tourist destination in their own right. But here they're window dressing. We've been filming for days, and we've barely even seen a tiny percent of it. Simply put, this place is enormous. But the seeds of Angkor's destruction were built into the very walls of the temples themselves. As the empire grew larger, its enemies wanted to invade it more. Its administration became more complex. And the irony of a finely tuned machine is that the more finely it's tuned, the easier it is for it to break down. If you have genius administration, 
Well, you hope that your next administrators are geniuses as well. But there were only so many jungles that you could burn into farmland. Deforestation quickly became a very serious problem. It was increasing floods, it was increasing instability, and yet even though the irrigation system was ingenious, that meant it was incredibly complicated. An unexpected shock ripped through the system like a virus in interconnected computers. While resources weren't exactly scarce, they were being consumed just as fast as they could be produced. The higher the taxes, the better the temple for the king. The world's largest megastructures don't come cheap. Taxes can only really be raised so far. With administrators already planting grain before it was harvested, everything relied on stability. There's no one thing that took down the Khmer Empire, at least as far as we know. The Thai invasion of 1431 certainly was a death knell, but the decline had been evident for generations before that. What we do know is that at some point in history, the greatest city on earth was all but abandoned and given back to the jungle. And I think that there's a strong argument that the same things that had built up the Khmer Empire are what collapsed it. It's just such a huge and intricate system, and the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So a period of poor administration with religious upheaval and royal coups, it just was too much for this intricate, complicated administration. War, weather, and weak leadership led to an environment that was ripe for invasion. After all, there's plenty of historical evidence to support this. If you look at Easter Island, for example, they cut down every single last tree in an attempt to sustain a system long past the point when that would have been considered irrational. With no external powers to invade, they simply withered from within. It's amazing how many societies collapsed simply because they couldn't handle change. If you are using 95% of your production and you have a production loss of 10%, it's not 5% of your society collapse, everything goes. But a growth system can't stop growing. It can't even stand still. The larger and more intricate the organization, the more vulnerable it is. A bad leader will destroy it, a new technology will replace it, an invading army will take it over, or as is perhaps the best analog to modern day, it simply won't be able to keep up with the climate changing around it. So in short, if you are in that golden age, there's a couple of things you're going to want to watch out for. Don't use your resources to the max. Don't vote in bad administrators for no reason. Don't fall behind on technology, and don't get into so many resource wars. And perhaps most of all, keep an eye on the climate. Clearly we have some things to work on. This is Rare Earth.